Okay. Dear friends, dear colleagues, welcome to a new Professional Voice Society Thursday webinar. Today we have a very distinguished guest, uh, a very good, a very old friend of mine. Uh, we have Professor Seon Keon Kwon with us. Uh, he is a professor at the Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery at Seoul National University Hospital and Division Head of Pediatric Otolaryngology. He is active in both basic and clinical research uh, and particularly interested in the translation of discoveries from bench to bedside. Uh, he is an old friend of mine. We will uh, we will be uh, we will be celebrating our 70th uh, anniversary as friends, and I am very proud of him because uh, he had managed many things uh, in both basic research field and also clinical research field. For those uh, for those beautiful things that he have accomplished. He actually uh, received the Kesselberry Award from the American Laryngological Association in uh, 2018. And he also received Broil, uh, Broil's Maloney Award two times for tracheal regeneration in 2016 and 2019 from the, from the American Bronchoesophagological Association. And of course, he has many domestic awards. He has many papers and many citations. He is a, he is a very active, and he is, he is a very hardworking uh, colleague of us. I am very proud to have Seon with us in Turkish Professional Voice Society webinar. Uh, and of course, uh, what I should emphasize is that uh, it's actually now 1 a.m. in uh, Seoul. Uh, so <laughs> Seon should be sleeping at that hour, but, uh, she, uh, but he spared that precious time for us. Uh, Seon, thank you very much. I really appreciate having you with us. Uh, thank you. The stage is yours. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for the kind introduction. Yeah, it's my uh, uh, pleasure to present my data here. Uh, thank you very much uh, again for invitation, uh, Uh Today, I'd like to talk about the uh, pediatric airway surgery under self-ventilation. So this is the difference between the adult and infant larynx. So as you know that uh, the infant larynx is located more higher uh, in the C4 area, and the epiglottis is most, most, much more cold uh, shaped. And in the trubocal fold layer, the five distinct layer is not well developed in the infant. And the uh, length of the membranous vocal fold is much more shorter compared to the other. And uh, what is most important things, the vocal fold region does not make impact on the airway in the adult, but it usually uh, make an impact on the airway. So these are uh, some representative image of the uh, several pediatric airway disease. And then the conflict between the anesthesiologist and ENT surgeon developed when we try to operate on these uh, patient. Usually the um, anesthesiologist uh, would like to intubate his patient. And if they intubate, uh, we cannot see the, uh, the uh, disease state properly. So we have to share the small airway uh, with the uh, anesthesiologist. Uh, these are uh, three aims that we would like to achieve in the airway surgery. For the ET surgeon, the proper surgical field most important. And for the uh, anesthesiologist, adequate ventilation and maintenance of anesthesia is more important. So this is the uh, most simplistic way, uh, and the, the anesthesiolo anesthesiologist loves this way. They just uh, intubate with a small endotracheal tube, and they want to leave their uh, uh, operating room. But uh, in this case, we, we cannot see the reason very properly. So we need a more uh, proper surgical field. 
uh, uh, most uh, simple uh, method to putting the uh, intubation tube away is to, is to perform the tracheostomy. But most of the uh, patient uh, parents uh, will not agree uh, easily with the tracheostomy. So we need the tubeless uh, uh, ventilation technique. Uh, these are uh, divided into tubeless mechanical ventilation and tubeless uh, spontaneous respiration method. So in tubeless mechanical ventilation, we use the uh, muscle relaxant, but in the spontaneous respiration method, we don't use the uh, muscle relaxant. In the uh, tubeless mechanical ventilation way, uh, there are two ways. Uh, it's an uh, intermittent apnea method. That means we have we remove intermittently the endotracheal tube and perform the operation. And if the saturation goes down, we then uh, reintubate. And, and that that's the intermittent apnea method. And you know that uh, jet ventilation method easily. But uh, this is the graph uh, for a normal adult. If we fully uh, oxygenate the uh, uh, normal 70 kilogram adult, um, it takes uh, about uh, eight minutes from the saturation, 100% uh, saturation goes down to the 90 uh, saturation percent. So we have uh, enough time to perform the operation during these uh, eight minutes. But in case of the uh, 10 kilo uh, child, <laughs> the time uh, shortened to the uh, around the three minutes. But uh, in in case with the airway uh, problem, this time usually around one minute. So we cannot perform uh, adequately the operation during the one minute. So definitely the intermittent apneic method is not uh, good for ENT surgeon. So the other method of E is the uh, jet ventilation. But if we do it, uh, it this is the tra transtractual jet ventilation and this is the transglottic jet ventilation. If we put the tip of the jet ventilator more deeply, uh, the complication increase, uh, and uh, there is uh, also associated a major complication like uh, tension pneumothorax and pneumothorax and some emphysema. So this is not definitely the, uh, another option for the children. So we need a uh, uh, tubeless spontaneous respiration method. Using this method, we can uh, evaluate the dynamic airway obstruction like uh, laryngomalacia or tracheobronchomalacia. And um, for the uh, depths of the anesthesia, if we use a uh, volatile anesthetic agent, it will pollute the surgical field and expose the surgeon to gas inhalation. So if I use the volatile agent, most of the, my assistant ENT resident will sleep during the uh, surgery. So I have to wake, wake them up. <laughs> so I prefer to use the total intravenous anesthesia, TIVA, because it is uh, easy to control the uh, depths of the anesthesia. Yeah. And it's much faster compared to the volatile agent. But if we use the uh, uh, TIVA, the, the respiration is slightly uh, depressed. So we need uh, uh, assist ventilation. Mm, so, so we use the high flow system for uh, adequate ventilation with the TIVA. Uh, this is a form, as you know, this is form of non-invasive uh, respiratory support. It was initially designed to treat uh, spontaneously breathing people uh, experiencing uh, respiratory compromise, like uh, immediately after the extubation. Uh, this is used for uh, assisting the ventilation. And uh, if we use this system, we can give the, give the patient uh, 
the 60 lit liters of the uh, oxygen per minute. Uh, it's very high flow. So it is named the high flow system. Um, the key mechanism of action is the reduction of the dead space and it can provide a dynamic positive airway pressure. Um, in the addition to the high flow, we use this piece uh, monitoring system to monitor the hypnosis. And because we don't use the endotracheal tube, we can we cannot measure the endo ET CO2 and, and the tidal CO2. So instead, we use the uh, TC CO2. This is the transcutaneous CO2 monitoring system. In addition, we use the oxygen reserve index. Uh, it is uh, it is used to detect the declining uh, uh, blood oxygenation prior to the SpO2 monitoring. So in SpO2 uh, monitoring, if the oxygen level is above the uh, 100 millimeter mercury, uh, the SpO2 is almost the same. So there is no difference. So there's no difference. If, even though the uh, oxygen uh, pressure is back, it's the SpO2 is back. And even though the uh, oxygen pressure is uh, 200, uh, the SpO2 is, remains 100. So oxygen reserve index uh, is used to indicate uh, this hyperoxic area from 100 to 200 millimeter mercury. It is a, a unit less scale. So this is the zero and this is the one. So if you use the ORI, um, this is this uh, red line is the SpO2. This black line is the ORI. Uh, if we don't use the ORI, we don't know when the SpO2 drops. Uh, so if we get the alarm from the SpO2, and if we try to intubate the patient from this part, the SpO2 will deeply decrease. But if we put on the uh, ORI here, we can uh, detect the decrease in the ORI earlier here. So if the ORI is below the uh, 0.3, we can prepare some uh, intubation or manual um, ventilation using a mask. So there will be, if we uh, start from here, there will be no uh, severe fluctuation in the SpO2 level. So we prefer to combine the ORI during the uh, pediatric airway surgery. This is the uh, room setup for pediatric airway surgery. Uh, these two are anesthesiologists and they watch over the monitor while I do the surgery. And they tell me it's time to quit and just uh, place the e tube instead of doing the uh, surgery. Uh, we began this uh, technique from 2017, and we could perform uh, various uh, procedures like a diagnostic uh, microlaryngoscopy and balotilatation and sprogloplasty. And uh, we could do, do it uh, as long as the 140 minutes, but the median duration was 40 minutes. And the uh, uh, lowest autosaturation was maintained uh, around 79%. And this was the first report on the uh, clinical application of high flow to pediatric patient. We could evaluate the uh, dynamic obstruction and degree of the stenosis. And we, we could discriminate focal fold palsy 
from uh, glucoarytenoin joint fixation, and we could uh, get the immediate outcome of the surgical treatment. And most importantly, we could avoid tracheostomy in all cases. Let me show you some uh, cases. This is the uh, previous healthy three months old uh, male patient. He developed a uh, progressive dyspnea. And you can see that this pinkish white mass just below the uh, left vocal fold. He was diagnosed with uh, uh, subvolatile hemangioma. And this 13 year old male uh, got a uh, traffic accident. Uh, he had a traumatic subdural hemorrhage and he was intubated for uh, one month. You can see the tracheal stenosis here. <laughs> and this is the 12 months, a 12 year old male. He developed the uh, dyspnea after he got the uh, a total thyroidectomy for a popular thyroid carcinoma. In the case of the uh, bilateral vocal fold paralysis, you must uh, discriminate from uh, the posterior glottic stenosis or cricoarytenoid joint fixation. If we uh, push one vocal fold like here, in bilateral vocal fold paralysis, it moves away, but in the posterior glottic uh, stenosis, like here, the posterior commissioner uh, has a synechia. So if you, even though you put one part, you cannot open the uh, vocal fold. So in case of the bilateral vocal fold palsy, if the patient is the adult, uh, we usually perform a uh, codotomy or arytenoidectomy. Uh, but it causes uh, irreversible damage to the larynx. So in case of the pediatric patient, I prefer to uh, perform the suture lateralizations because it, it is uh, reversible. So I do the suture lateralization with uh, this Richtenberg needle carrier. After confirming the movement of the CA joint, I uh, first I uh, 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 push the uh, needle through the thyroid cartilage below the vocal fold. Then, uh, I uh, push the needle just above the vocal fold and uh, make a subcutaneous tunneling, and then I make a tie. So this is another case. Uh, this is a one year uh, old man. He received uh, uh, several operation from other hospital for a tracheoesophageal fistula. After the operation, he developed a bilateral vocal fold paralysis. So I just checked the mobility of the CA joint here. He had a severe uh, tracheomalacia because of the TF. And after locating the tip just below the vocal fold, I pushed the button and the assistant takes the needle here. Then the second um, thing just above the through vocal fold. And the direction should be uh, perpendicular to the tubercle fold. And you have to um, put the suture at the cartilaginous portion of the tubercle fold. If the uh, 
suture material is uh, at the uh, membranous focal fold, it will transect the uh, membranous focal fold. And under the guide of the endoscope, I make a, a tie, and this is the final result. Uh, he had a severe streeter before the operation. And the focal fold was closed completely. And this is uh, three days after the operation. And uh, you can see a small hole at the left focal fold here, posterior part. And this is the case of the laryngomalacia. Uh, this is the uh, only classification. Mm, we can divide the laryngomalacia into type one to three. Type one is the inward collapse of the redundant uh, arytenoid mucosa. And type two is characterized uh, by a long tubular epiglottis with the short AE fold. And type 3 is characterized by the uh, inward collapse of the epiglottis, like here. So, in the case of the type 3 laryngomalacia, I prefer to use the lithium bubble needle carrier uh, instead of suturing. Uh, inside the uh, the uh, uh, pharynx. So first, I make a uh, uh, mucosal vaporization with the CO two laser at the uh, uh, tongue base and the the epiglottis uh, surface. Then I make an incision in the AE fold because in this patient, the AE fold was very short. <clears throat> then using the uh, lictin bubble needle carrier, two sutures is made. <laughs> and after a subcute tunneling, uh, two threads are joined into one to one hole, and then we make a tie. This is before the operation. This is the one week after the operation. And let me talk about the laryngeal cleft. It is usually associated with the TEF, GRD, or uh, factor or charge associations. Uh, and then the uh, laryngoscope, if, if you don't palpate, it is very difficult to find the laryngeal cleft. But if you push some cotton from anterior to the posterior way, uh, there is a cleft. You can find the cleft between two vocal folds at the posterior part. So it is classified by uh, four types. You can do the endoscopic repair if the uh, type is in type 1, 2, 3A. So first we remove the edge uh, mucosa with the CO2 laser and try to suture them. But it is very difficult to suture in two layers, so I prefer to do it in one layer. This is the two month old male. So the 
here. At the the edge of the mucosa, I make uh, uh, sutures. Imagine that if the patient was intubated, it would be impossible to expose this area. So this was done under the self-ventilation method. So we could suture them here. And uh, this is the uh, balloon latitude for uh, subotic stenosis grade three. So just one or two part uh, vaporized with the silt laser. I don't think the video is working well. And after incising incision, I put the uh, balloon here and inflate them like uh, uh, one or two minutes. And then the balloon is deflated and we have a much larger airway rumen. So we could avoid the tracheostomy in this uh, 13 years old female. And I also use it for uh, removing the airway foreign body. Uh, usually I don't use the rigid bronchoscope for removing the airway foreign body. So uh, you can identify the foreign body at the right main bronchus here. So under the suspension laryngoscope, I use the optical forceps. And grab them deeply. And then I remove the foreign body. So it's much more easier than uh, using the rigid bronchoscope. So this was the peanut. And I'd like to talk about the subrotic cyst. It's a very rare uh, disease. Um, it happens after the uh, endotracheal intubation which caused the uh, um, fibrosis and squaring and subsequent obstruction of the submucosal uh, gland duct and the cyst will be formed. And uh, as the mucus uh, accumulate in the cyst, it will cause more uh, straighter and dyspnea months after the extubation. So this patient had a, like a barking cough and with the dyspnea and I uh, maspialized the uh, cyst with the CO2 laser and the cold knife and balloon dilate. This is the immediately after the operation. So, on the literature, the reported rate of the tracheostomy in the subrotic cyst is uh, around uh, 20 or 30%. The largest case came from the uh, Great Ormond Street Hospital, and they had a uh, 55 percent, uh, uh, 55 uh, cases, and uh, 14 cases get the tracheostomy to remove the uh, subrotic cyst. But in our experience, 
from the 14 cases, we could avoid a tracheostomy in all cases using this high flow system. And this is the uh, very uh, unusual cases, TEF. He had a second uh, fistula just above the um, original TEF, which was ligated by the um, general surgeons. So instead of going a uh, second time, I uh, removed the mucosa of the TF tract and have the TF tract was completely obstructed. This is two weeks after the operation. Yes, you see, completely obstructed TF uh, site. And this is the uh, bronchomalacia case. This patient had a uh, uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. So the left main bronchus was totally collapsed by the uh, dilated uh, heart. And the um, secretion uh, from the left heart, left lung uh, was accumulated and the um, left lung uh, had a, a total collapse with the pneumonia. So um, using the rigid bronchoscope, I uh, performed the toileting for two hours. So the, because the heart was so big, uh, the sternum was open state, and you can see the total collapse of the left lung here. And this is uh, after bronchoscopic uh, toileting. Uh, even though the you can see the lung shadow here, the heart was so big, so I thought this patient couldn't survive because of this heart. But um, he got the uh, heart transplantation. So he, now he has a, a normal heart and with the normal uh, uh, lung. He develops uh, very well. And my last topic for pediatric airway surgery is the recurrent respiratory papillomatosis. So as you know, it, it is caused by the uh, ACPB type 6 or 11. You can uh, uh, remove the disease by cold instrument or micro debrider or lasers. Uh, I began to use the KTP laser oh. five years ago because it has a more selective Photothermolysis effect. It can cause the um, blood vessel um, coagulate, coagulation, and the papilloma. Uh, compared to the CO2 laser, it has a less damage to the mucosa and surrounding tissue. So we can avoid the uh, synechia or mucosal damage if you use the uh, KTP laser. This is the five-year-old male cases. And uh, after four operation using the KTP laser, finally, uh, he was disease-free state without any uh, uh, synechia or tropical fold damage. And this is the more severe cases. He got uh, uh, surgery 30 times. Um, 
And uh, after a while, now the vocal fold is much more uh, uh, without the disease. The, the disease burden decreased, but he still recurs. Uh, but even though we have performed the 30 times of the surgery, uh, we could avoid the tracheostomy and um, we could preserve the anterior commissure and posterior commissure. So he doesn't have any dyspnea. Uh, this is the summary of the five-year experience. Uh, we have performed the uh, about 350 cases, and most of them was under the age uh, one. The most common procedure was microlaryngoscopy and balloon dilatation and TCF excision and sprogloplasty and papilloma surgery. We used the uh, laser in the eight cases, but there was no airway fire uh, event. The mean uh, lowest SpO2 was uh, 98 in all cases. But uh, some cases uh, experienced uh, low SbO2, but all cases recovered without long-standing complications. We, so we could do the uh, planned procedures without any uh, uh, problem. So after performing these cases in the pediatrics, uh, we are extending these cases to the adult and we compared it uh, with the endotracheal intubation cases. And compared with endotracheal intubation, patients with high flow showed a reduced operation time because the operation field was much more wider and it, they had uh, reduced the anesthesia time without significant decrease in SpO2. And this technique was usual, uh, uh, most useful uh, in the postgraduate region, like in this case in papilloma. If we intubate this patient, we cannot uh, evaluate whole uh, larynx, but without the ETU, we could do it easily. And we can perform the uh, balloon dilatation for a posterior glottic stenosis patient. And this is a 72-year-old female. She had a, a, a surgery five times at other hospital uh, for uh, RRP. She came to me because of the uh, dyspnea. She had a large snake here, anterior part, and uh, she had a dangling uh, papilloma, which was uh, intermittently obstructing the airway. So we used the high flow system for her. This is the suspension laryngoscopy. First, I made an a incision on the laryngeal web using cold knife. Even though there is some bleeding, it's not the significant bleeding. So I kept on. After making some airway, I removed the papilloma with the CO2 laser. This is uh, one month after the operation. Even though mm -hmm. there's a, some synechia again, she has much wider airway. The, so I do the uh, 
open airway surgery or to do it uh, with a partial clinical trachea relaxation. So, and I'm going to go very fast. So, yeah. Instead of the uh, language instructions, I prefer uh, PCTR because it heals much faster because I removed all the disease segment. And this is much, much more younger case. Mm. So this is only four weeks after the operation and it healed quite well without any uh, stenosis. Mm -hmm. And she has a much wider airway after for uh, eight weeks after the operation. So there are some cases that I cannot uh, make a wide airway. So I am keeping on going on um, tracheal tissue engineering. And uh, I have published, published several uh, uh, papers in the high impact journal like uh, PNAS, and biomaterials, and some of them was chosen as the cover articles. And I'm, I'm running a uh, five uh, government research project nowadays. So in conclusion, high flow assisted ventilation was very useful for diagnosis and treatment of the pediatric airway. And uh, it facilitated the evaluation of the dynamic obstruction of the airway, and we could identify the immediate of outcome of surgical treatment. Because it provided a good surgical review, the operation time was reduced, and they allows, allowed us to avoid tracheostomy. So this method is a highly effective and safe option for pediatric airway surgery. And uh, I'm going to host the 7th Asia Pacific uh, Pediatric Airway Conference next year in our country. So if you are uh, interested in, please uh, use this uh, website and please come to Korea. And I'm going to uh, host another domestic airway management workshop this November. We published the new book on the tracheostomy. So we are celebrating this book and having a workshop on this November. And uh, thank you for your attention. And thank you for Harden for inviting me. This photo was taken in 2005 and uh, we met in the Harvard, when I uh, visited the Jaiter's uh, office, I had a chance to meet him. And thank you again for inviting me. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. It was it was a real pleasure listening to you. And, and when I was listening to you, uh, I really felt privileged because you were you were showing those cases, those videos as if they were so easy to manage, but uh, we surgeons really know how difficult it is to share that airway with the anesthesiologists, especially in such young patients. And you have mm -hmm. shown that most of your patients are under one years of age. So it's an excellent job you are doing. And I am very proud that we had the chance to host you, to be with you. 
And, and, and I think this, this video, your presentation will reach to many surgeons worldwide and they will, they will get uh, benefit from you, contact you and your, uh, your type of uh, approach to those patients will, uh, will light a bulb on their head and will, they will be working on these subjects more clearly. Thank you very much. It was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, now Thank you. I, will, I will request questions if they if they have any from our audience. Uh, but while uh, preparing their questions, if they have, uh, I will ask a few questions if you don't mind. I know it's nearly two a.m. now in Seoul, but we will have just a few questions and let you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's my honor. Thank you. Uh, uh, actually, there. Uh, there was one questions uh, yeah. from the Q and A, and yeah. I, I found Nur it. Nurullah is asking a question: uh, Is there a risk of aspiration by the stir procedure that you have shown uh, for supraglioplasty for laryngomalacia? Uh, actually, uh, at the in initial uh, stage after the operation, there's uh, some risk of the aspiration. Uh, but they usually uh, accustomed to it. So within two or three three days after the operation, uh, we, we don't worry about the aspiration. But if the symptom persists before the operation, if the, uh, actually the laryngomalacia patient uh, suffer from the aspiration because during the, uh, during, during eating, uh, they, if they suffer from the uh, dyspnea, uh, they cannot drink it very well. And during the uh, during drinking, uh, because of the dyspnea, they open the airway, uh, vocal fold, and they aspirate. So usually the aspiration symptoms get better after the laryngomalacia surgery. So you don't have to worry about the aspiration. Thank you. And what would be a main uh, risk or a contraindication for high flow assisted ventilation technique? I mean, you told you told us that this is the first uh, paper that you published about this, uh, and nobody has uh, used this before. And you know, we have some conservative uh, anesthesiologists sometimes to approach patients. What may be the main risk while we are dealing with a uh, high flow technique? Actually, at the beginning stage, almost always there was two anesthesiologist staff in my operating room because we don't have the consequence or the anything about the high flow. Mm -hmm. But now uh, I have only one resident anesthesiologist in my operating room. The first year, it, it is very very easy. Okay. There's no much complication. But you have to be very careful if there is a skull base fracture. And if you use the high flow, the, the air can uh, blow into the brain, into the skull. So that's the one uh, most definite contraindication of the high flow. And uh, if the patient have the multi-level airway obstruction, uh, even though we apply the high flow uh, oxygen, the, usually the patient cannot um, sustain the operating uh, procedures. So in that case, we need to intubate or uh, we need the tracheostomy. Okay. And another question is about your sturilateralization for bilateral paralysis. Uh, when you use only sutures, uh, because uh, uh, actually your pa your patients were all, all children, of course, but uh, when you apply those sutures, uh, do you sometimes see that uh, those sutures are relaxed? Do you, do you see a relaxation? So an, a, a, another uh, new collapse at the airway, uh, because it's not a cordotomy, it's not like an arytenoidotomy. You are not destroying the tissue there. So uh, how do you feel uh, about the results of uh, suture lateralization? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, uh, I mentioned that you, the direction of the suture must be perpendicular to the uh, true vocal fold. That's the one key uh, technique 
to avoid the loosening of the uh, sutures. And, and I usually make a small cut at the bokeh process uh, before I suture with the CO2 laser. Mm -hmm. And if, if there is a small hole uh, around the uh, bokeh, for, uh, bokeh process, the suture material will not uh, get loosened. So it will remain uh, at the suture site. And after one or two months later, you cannot identify any suture material. It, is, it will be covered by the mucosa. So uh, you told us a trick that you, uh, you make a groove for the suture on the vocal process. I mean, on the cartilage so that it remains there better and it uh, tracks uh, the vocal fold to the lateral part. And we are yes. always talking about suture lateralization. You also mentioned it. Uh, while suture lateralization, we always tell it like reversible because mm -hmm. uh, we don't destroy anything. We don't take the cartilage out. We don't cut the vocal fold like in a chordotomy. So it's, uh, we always say it's reversible, but uh, if you have uh, a follow-up of patients for long-term, say, uh, do you see that when you have suture lateralized one part and the other one is still the same, do you feel that there is a scar there uh, or do you think that that suture lateralization permanently changes anything there? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I have performed uh, several cases of the uh, suture lateralization, but honestly, I didn't remove the suture from any of the patient. So I didn't uh, uh, go again into the operating room to look into the uh, suture area. So I cannot uh, uh, answer exactly about your questions. And uh, if I uh, ask the patient or patient parents, do you want to remove the suture material, and they usually reply, "No, uh, they don't want the, that risk of the going sure. again." So, so I, I honestly, uh, I never performed the, removing the suture material after oh. I operating the suture lateralization, and I'm going to uh, show you some uh, hole here. Yeah, so you, yes, can you see this part? Yeah. So I make a yeah, CO2 laser incision this part of the bokeh process. And uh, I usually make a suture around this hole. So it will have the loosening of the uh, suture material. Yeah. Actually, the, the videos that you have shown us were excellent, Seong. Thank you. Uh, they were so demonstrative while you are putting the suture and all the videos were very demonstrative. And uh, actually, let me just share with uh, you that one of my, uh, one of my, uh, I mean, a group of my colleagues that I worked together uh, wrote that modified suture lateralization technique in adults, and they uh, they also perform just a small chordotomy in front of the vocal mm -hmm. process, just anterior to the vocal protest process, to perform a scar for lateralization. And also mm -hmm. to, uh, I mean, to separate the uh, vocal part of the vocal cord, I mean, the anterior part and the air, airway part of the vocal fold, the posterior part. Of course, they are uh, permanent cases. They are adult cases, not like the ones here. Uh, uh, and I really, uh, I mean, I am a good, uh, 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 how can I say, supporter of uh, suture lateralization in bilateral paralysis. So thank you. These were excellent cases. And Seong, we have another question from the audience. Actually, Jiren asked a question. Uh, and she is asking that, what is your first choice treatment method for posterior glottic stenosis? And do you have any options for recurrent cases? If you use any kind of implants or any kind of precautions uh, to uh, prevent risk stenosis? Uh, yes, uh, you know that there is a, some great system for posterior glottic stenosis also. So if if the the if it is severe, you cannot perform the suture lateralization, and if it is if it is not uh, severe enough, 
first I can uh, uh, make an incision on the uh, post commercial area and, and make a suture lateralization. And in addition to that, I perform, uh, inject the Botox in the interarytenoid area to, to prevent the re-stenosis. Uh, and sometimes I, uh, if the uh, post-regulatory stenosis is, is not severe, I, I perform the, um, after in, uh, incision, the post commercial area, I perform the bolon dilatation with the Botox injection. But if it is severe enough, I perform the uh, posterior cartilage graft from the, uh, the lip cartilage. I do the, uh, yeah, one stage uh, lip cartilage graft for posterior glottic stenosis. Okay, thank you. And you had one adult patient at the uh, last slides of yours. Uh, it was like a 70 year old gentleman uh, or lady with recurrent respiratory papillomatosis that you that yes. you uh, that you made an incision with your scissors with your cold uh, instruments. Uh, yes, after yes. you perform such an incision, do you apply anything there, Seong, to prevent uh, another yeah. snake here? There. Yeah, of course. I I I do use the. Uh, mitomycin okay. to to decrease the restosis. If the um, stones is uh, severe, I perform the uh, triamshinol injection. That that's the uh, two uh, drugs that I use for the to prevent to prevent the uh, snakea. But uh, in this slide, I didn't show the Mm, applying the mitomycin uh, okay. for the time of the uh, photo shake of the time. Sure. Thank you. We have another question, Seong. Uh, this is uh, from an associate professor, uh, otolaryngologist friend of us. Arzu Betul is asking, uh, most of the operations were diagnostic laryngoscopy in your publication. Can we assume mm -hmm. that after the direct laryngoscopy, when the diagnosis is clear, you go on for the treatment at the same session? If so, what are the minimum requir required instruments or options in the operating room for pediatric cases? Uh, so, you know, you cannot always find the instruments that you like, Seong. For example, I love that Lichtenberger instrument, but I mm -hmm. never had it. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I will I will tell you the options that I use in the operating room when you are in Antalya. Yeah. So uh, if uh, if we are in a limited setting, what are the minimum requirements for making pediatric cases? So the most of the diagnostic laryngoscopy cases were uh, severe severe cases. I mean the grade three or grade four uh, subglottic stenosis with the tracheostomy, uh, sometimes with the tracheostomy. So in the severe uh, subglottic stenosis cases, I prefer to delay the open air surgery until they get uh, old enough, like three years old. So most, um, uh, some of them were enrolled into the diagnostic laryngoscopy cases. And some of the uh, patient, patient parents uh, did not agree in performing the uh, tracheostomy. So even though the patient get intubated for a long time, uh, I, I, I usually meet the uh, parents at the front of the operating room and I try to appreciate them in this case, this patient need a tracheostomy, but they don't uh, agree. So it just uh, cannot perform the tracheostomy. So in the case, the diagnostic uh, laryngoscopy uh, were enrolled. And um, the, another case with the diagnostic laryngoscopy is usually with the tracheobronchomalacia. Uh, and uh, if that is not severe, enough, we don't do uh, um, any uh, uh, operation 
we can just wait and uh yeah and the, these are uh, these threes are uh, most of the uh, um, cases with the diagnostic uh, uh, laryngoscopic cases and uh, in our operating room uh we usually have uh, several sets of the uh, laryngoscopy set and also we have um several sets for uh, uh open air surgery so uh, usually we have all the instrument with me so <laughs> yeah okay yeah that's uh, the that's the very difficult questions <laughs> <laughs> so you you usually need the uh, uh holum laryngoscopy and um you, you we we need uh, some metal suctions yeah and some uh cup forceps and yeah, that's the basic minimum requirement uh, instrument for the diagnostic laryngoscopy dear so on thank you very much i can listen to you more but uh, it will be morning in korea so uh, uh, i'm just closing your uh, screen sharing uh, please, can you just close the screen share so that we can have a photo together? <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, that's good. That's yeah. a good one. Okay. Uh, now I request a big smile from you. <laughs> so that we can make new memories to share later. <laughs> it, okay. was, it, was, it was excellent listening to you. Uh, I thank you very, very much once again, and I also thank the audience uh, that spent their time with us at the last hour. Uh, we will have the privilege, we will have the chance to host uh, Professor Kwon, uh, my dear friend Seong in Antalya in next April in the UEP Congress. We also would like to see you there with us. Seong, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate your time and being with us, and I hope to meet you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was Thank my you. pleasure. Thank you very Good much. Night. See you. Bye bye. See you in Natalia. Yes, we do.